I, Claudius, by Robert Graves. Chapter 14 Although it had been clear that Augustus's powers were failing and that he had not many more years to live, Rome could not accustom itself to the idea of his death. It is not an idle comparison to say that the city felt much as a boy feels when he loses his father, whether the father has been a brave man or a coward, just or unjust, generous or mean, signifies little. He has been that boy's father, and no uncle or elder brother can ever take his place. For Augustus's rule had been a very long one, and a man had to be already past middle age to remember back behind it. It was therefore not altogether unnatural that the Senate met to deliberate whether the divine honors which had, even in his lifetime, been paid him by the provinces should now be voted him in the city itself. Polio's son, Gallus, hated by Tiberius because he had married Vespania, Tiberius's first wife, you will recall, whom he had been forced to divorce on Julia's account, and became, and because he had never given a public denial of the rumor which made him the real father of Castor, and because he had a witty tongue, this Gallus was the only senator who had dared to question the propriety of the motion. He rose to ask what divine portent had occurred to suggest that Augustus would be welcomed in the heavenly mansions, merely at the recommendation of his mortal friends and admirers. There followed an uncomfortable silence. But at last Tiberius rose slowly and said, One hundred days ago, it will be recalled, the pediment of my father Augustus's statue was struck by lightning. The first letter of his name was blotted out, which left the words, Azir Augustus. What is the meaning? Of the letter C. It is the sign for 100. What does Esser mean? I shall tell you. It means God in the Etruscan tongue. Clearly, in a hundred days from that lightning stroke, Augustus is to become a god in Rome. What clearer portent than this can you require? Though Tiberius took the sole credit for this interpretation, it was I who had first given meaning to Azir. The queen, the queer word, had been much discussed, being the only person at Rome who was acquainted with the Etruscan language. I told my mother about it, and she called me a fanatical fool. But she must have been sufficiently impressed to repeat what I said to Tiberius, before I told nobody but her. Gallus asked why Jove should give his messages in Etruscan rather than in Greek or Latin. Could nobody swear to having observed any other more conclusive omen? It was all very well to decree new gods to ignorant Asiatic provincials, but the honorable house ought to pause before ordering educated citizens to worship one of their own number, however distinguished. Is it possible that Gallus would have succeeded in blocking the decree of 
by this appeal to Roman pride and sanity, had it not been for a man called Atticus, a senior magistrate. He solemnly rose to say that when Augustus's corpse had been burned on Mars Field, he had seen a cloud descending from heaven, and the dead man's spirit then ascending on it, precisely in the way in which tradition relates that the spirits of Romulus and Hercules ascended. He would swear by all the gods that he was testifying the truth. This speech was greeted with resounding applause, and Tiberius triumphantly asked whether Gallus had any further remarks to make. Gallus said that he had. He recalled, he said, another early tradition about the sudden death and disappearance of Romulus, which appeared in the works of even the gravest historians as an alternative to the one quoted by the honorable and voracious friend Atticus, namely that Romulus was so hated for his tyranny over a free people that one day took advantage of a sudden fog the Senate murdered him, cut him up, and carried the pieces away under their robes. But what about Hercules? Someone hurriedly asked. Gallus said, Tiberius himself, in his eloquent oration at the funeral, repudiated the comparison between Augustus and Hercules. His words were, Hercules, in his childhood, dealt only with serpents, and even when a man only with a stag or two and a wild boar which he killed and a lion and even this he did reluctantly and at somebody's command whereas Augustus fought not with beasts but with men and of his own free will and so forth and so forth but my reason for repudiating the comparison lies in the circumstances of Hercules' death. Then he sat down. The reference was perfectly clear to anybody who considered the matter, for the legend was that Hercules died of poison administered by his wife. But the motion for Augustus's deification was carried. Shrines were built to him in Rome and the neighboring cities. An order of priests was formed for administering his rites and Livia, who had at the same time been granted the titles of Julia and Augusta, was made his high priestess. Atticus was rewarded by Livia with a gift of 10,000 gold pieces and was appointed one of the new priests of Augustus being even excused the heavy initiation fee. I was also appointed a priest, but had to pay a higher initiation fee than anyone, because I was Olivia's grandson. Nobody dared ask why this vision of Augustus's ascent had only been seen by Atticus, and the joke was that on the night before the funeral, Livia had concealed an eagle in a cage at the top of the pyre, which was to be opened as soon as the pyre was lit by someone secretly pulling a string from below. The eagle would then fly up and was intended to be taken for Augustus's spirit. Unfortunately, the miracle had not come off. The cage door refused to open. Instead of saying nothing and letting the eagle burn, the officer who was in charge clambered up the pyre and opened the cage door with his hands. Olivia had to say that the eagle had been thus released at her orders as a symbolic act. I shall not write more about Augustus's funeral though a more magnificent one has never been seen at Rome, for I must now 
begin to omit all things in my story except those of the first importance. I have already filled more than 13 rolls of the best paper from the new paper-making factory I have recently equipped, and not reached a third of the way through it. But I must not fail to tell about the contents of Augustus's will, the reading of which was awaited with a general interest and impatience. Nobody was more anxious to know what it contained than I was, and I shall explain why. A month before his death, Augustus had suddenly appeared at the door of my study. He had been visiting my mother, who was just convalescent after a long illness, and after dismissing his attendants, had begun to talk to me in a rambling way, and not looking directly at me, but behaving as shyly as though he were Claudius and I were Augustus. He picked up a book of his history and read a passage. Excellent writing, he said, and how soon will the work be finished? I told him, in a month or less, and he congratulated me and said that he would then give orders to have a public reading of it at his own expense, inviting his friends to attend. I was perfectly astonished at this, but he went on in a friendly way to ask if I would not prefer a professional reciter to do justice to it rather than read myself. He said that public reading of one's own work must be very embarrassing, even though old Polio had confessed that he was always nervous on such occasions. I thanked him most sincerely and heartily, and said that a professional would obviously be more suitable if my work indeed deserved such an honor. Then he suddenly held out his hand to me. Claudius, do you bear me any ill will? What could I say to that? Tears came to my eyes, and I muttered that I reverenced him, and that he had never done anything to deserve my ill will. He said with a sigh, No, but on the other hand, little to earn your love. Wait a few months longer, Claudius, and I hope to be able to earn both your love and your gratitude. Germanicus has told me about you. He says that you are loyal to three things, to your friends, to Rome, and to the truth. I should be very proud if Germanicus thought the same of me. Germanicus' love for you falls only a little short of outright worship, I said. He has often told me so. His face brightened. You swear it? I am very happy. So now, Claudius, there's a strong bond between us. The good opinion of Germanicus. And what I came to tell you was this. I have treated you very badly all these years, and I am sincerely sorry. And from now on, you'll see that things will change. He quoted in Greek. Who wounded thee shall make thee whole. And with that, he embraced me. As he turned to go, he said over his shoulder, I have just paid a visit to the Vestal Virgins and made some important alterations in a document of mine in their charge. And since you yourself are partly responsible for these, I have given your name a greater prominence there than it had before. But not a word. You can trust me, I said. He could only have meant one thing by this that he had believed Posthumus's story as I had reported it to Germanicus and was now restoring him in his will. 
which was in charge of the Vestals as his heir, and that I was to benefit too as a reward for my loyalty to him. I did not then, of course, know of Augustus's visit to Planasia, but confidently expected that Posthumus would be brought back and treated with honor. Well, I was disappointed, since Augustus had been so secretive about the new will, which had been witnessed by Fabius Maximus, and a new decrepit old priests, a few decrepit old priests. It was easy to suppress it in favor of one which had been made six years before the time of the disinheriting of Posthumus. The opening sentence was, For as much as a sinister fate has bereft me of Gaius and Lucius my sons, it is now my will that Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, Caesar become heir in the first range of two-thirds of my estate, and of the remaining third in the first range also. It is now my will that my beloved wife Livia shall become my heir, if so be that the Senate will graciously permit her to inherit this much, for it is in excess of the statutory allowance for a widow's legacy, making an exception in her case as having deserved so well of the state. In the second range, that is, in the event of the first mentioned legates dying or becoming otherwise incapable to inherit. He put such of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren as were members of the Julian house and had incurred no public disgrace, but posthumous had been disinherited. So, this meant Germanicus as Tiberius's adopted son and Agrippina's husband and Agrippina herself and her children and Castor, Lavilla and their children. The opening sentence was, For as much as a sinister fate has bereft me of Gaius and Lucius my sons, it is now my will that Tiberius Claudius Nero Caesar become heir in the first range of two-thirds of my estate, and of the remaining third in the first range also. It is now my will that my beloved wife, Livia, shall become my heir, if so, be that the Senate will graciously permit her to inherit this much, for it is in excess of the statutory allowance for a widow's legacy, making an exception in her case as having deserved so well of the state. In the second range, that is, in the event of the first mentioned legates dying or becoming otherwise incapable to inherit, he put such of his grandchildren and great grandchildren as were members of the Julian house and had incurred no public disgrace, but posthumous had been disinherited. So this meant Germanicus as Tiberius's adopted son and Agrippina's husband and Agrippina herself and her children, and Kester, Lavilla, and her children. In this second range, Castor was to inherit a third, and Germanicus and his family two-thirds of the estate. In the third range, the will named various senators and distant connections, but as a mark of favor rather than as likely to benefit. <clears throat> 
Augustus cannot have expected to outlive so many heirs of the first and second ranges. The third range heirs were grouped in three categories. The most favored ten were set down to be joint heirs of half the estate. The next most favored fifty were set down to share a third of the estate, and the third class contained the names of fifty more who were to inherit the remaining six. The last name in this last list of the last range was Tiberius Claudius Drusus Nero Germanicus, which meant Cla Cla Claudius, or Claudius the Idiot, or as Germanicus is, little boys were already learning to call him, poor Uncle Claudius. In fact, myself, there was no mention of Julia, or Jula. There was no mention of Julia, or Julilla, except a clause forbidding their ashes to be interred in the mausoleum beside his own when they came to die. Now, although Augustus had in the previous twenty years benefited under the wills of the old friends he had outlived, to the extent of no less than a hundred and forty million gold pieces, and had lived a most parsimonious life, he had spent so much on temples and public works, on doles and entertainments for the populace, on frontier wars, when there was no money left in the military treasury, and on similar state expense, that of those 140 millions and a great mass of private treasure besides, accumulated from various sources, a mere 15 million remain for bequest. Must much of this not easily realizable in cash. This did not, however, include certain important sums of money not reckoned in the estate and ready tied up in sacks in the vaults of the capital, which had been set aside in particular bequest to confederate kings, to senators and knights, to his soldiers, and to the citizens of Rome. These amounted to two million more. There was also a sum set aside for the expenses of his funeral. Everyone was surprised at the smallness of the estate, and all sorts of ugly rumors went round until Augustus's accountants were produced. Until Augustus's accounts were produced, and it was clear that there was no fraud on the part of the executors. The citizens were most discontented with their meager bequest. And when a memorial play was exhibited in Augustus's honor at the public expense, there was a riot in the theater. The Senate had so stinted the grant that one of the actors in the play refused to appear for the fee offered him. On the discontent in the army, I shall tell shortly, but first about Tiberius. Augustus had made Tiberius his colleague and his heir, but could not bequeath him the monarchy, or not in so many words. He could only recommend him to the Senate to whom all the powers he had exercised now reverted. The Senate did not like Tiberius or wish him to be emperor, but Germanicus, whom they would have chosen if they had been given the chance, was away, and Tiberius's claims could not be disregarded. So nobody dared to mention the name but that of Tiberius, and there were no dissentients from the motion introduced by the consuls, inviting him to take over Augustus's tasks were he had laid it down. He gave an evasive answer, emphasizing the immense responsibility that they were trying to put on him and his own 
unaspiring disposition. He said that the god Augustus alone had been capable of this mighty charge, and that, in his opinion, it would be best to divide up Augustus's offices into three parts, and so divide the responsibility. Senators, anxious to curry favor with him, pleaded that the triumvirate, or three-man rule, had been tried more than once in the preceding century, and that a monarchy had been found the only remedy for the resulting civil wars. A disgraceful scene followed. Senators pretended to weep and lament, and embarrassed Tiberius's, and embraced Tiberius's knees, imploring him to do as they asked. Tiberius, to cut this business short, said that he did not wish to shirk any charge laid upon him, but held by his assertion that he was not equal to the whole burden. He was no longer a young man. He was fifty-six years old, and his eyesight was not good. But he would undertake any particular part entrusted to him. All this was done so that nobody would be able to accuse him of seizing power too eagerly, and especially so that Germanicus and Posthumus, wherever he happened to be, might be impressed by the strength of his position in the city. For he was afraid of Germanicus, whose popularity with the army was infinitely greater than his own. He did not believe Germanicus capable of seizing the power for his own selfish ends, but thought that if he knew of the suppressed will, he might try to restore Posthumus to his rightful inheritance, and even to make him the third, Tiberius, Germanicus, and Posthumus, in the new triumvirate. Agrippina was devoted to Posthumus, and Germanicus took her advice as consistently as Augustus had taken Livius. If Germanicus marched on Rome, the Senate would go out in a body to welcome him. Tiberius knew that. And at the worst, by behaving modestly, now he would be able to escape with his wife, with his life, and live in honorable retirement. The Senate realized that Tiberius really wanted what he was so modestly refusing, and were about to renew their pleas when Gallus interposed in a practical voice. Very well, then, Tiberius, which part of the government do you want to be entrusted to you? Tiberius was confounded by this awkward and unforeseen question. He was silent for some time, and at last said, The same man cannot both make the division and choose, and even if this were possible, it would be immodest for me to choose or reject any particular branch of the administration when, as I have explained, I really want to be excused the whole of it. Gallus pressed his advantage. The only possible division of the empire would be, first, Rome and all Italy, second, the armies, and third, the provinces. Which of these would you choose? When Tiberius was silent, Gallus continued, Good, I know there's no answer. That's why I asked the question. I wanted you to admit, by your silence, that it was nonsense to speak of splitting into three an administrative system that has been built up and centrally coordinated by a single individual. Either we must return to the republican form of government, or we must continue with the monarchy. It is wasting the time of the house, which appears to have 
decided in favor of the monarchy, to go on talking about triumvirates. You have been offered the monarchy. Take it or leave it. Another senator, a friend of Gallus's, said, As protector of the people, you have the power of vetoing the motion of the consuls offering you the monarchy. If you really don't want it, you should have used your veto half an hour ago. So Tiberius was forced to beg the Senate's pardon and to say that the suddenness and unexpectedness of the honor had overcome him. He begged leave to consider his answer a little longer. The Senate then adjourned, and in succeeding sessions, Tiberius gradually allowed himself to be voted, one by one, all Augustus's offices. But he never used the name Augustus, which had been bequeathed him, except when writing letters to foreign kings, and was careful to discourage any tendency to pay him divine honors. There was another explanation of this cautious behavior of his, namely that Livia had boasted in public that he was receiving the monarchy as a gift from her hands. She made the boast not only to strengthen her position as Augustus's widow, but to warn Tiberius that if her crimes ever came to light, he would be regarded as her accomplice, being the person who principally benefited from them. Naturally, he wished to appear under no obligation to her, but as having had the monarchy forced on him against his will by the Senate. The Senate were profuse in their flattery of Livia, and wanted to confer many unheard-of honors on her. But Livia, as a woman, could not attend the debates in the Senate, and was legally now under Tiberius's guardianship. He had become head of the Julian House. So, having himself refused the title Father of the Country, he had refused, on her behalf, the title Mother of the Country, which had been offered her on the ground that modesty would not allow her to accept it. Nevertheless, he was greatly afraid of Livia, and at first wholly dependent on her, for learning the inner secrets of the imperial system. It was not merely a matter of understanding the routine, the criminal dossiers, of every man of importance in the two orders, and of most of the important women's secret service reports of various sorts, Augustus's private correspondence with Confederate kings and their relatives, copies of treasonable letters, intercepted but duly forwarded, all these were in Livia's keeping, and written in cipher, and Tiberius could not read them without her help. But he also knew that she was extremely dependent on him. There was an understanding between them of guarded cooperation. She even thanked him for refusing the title offered her, saying that he had been right to do so, and in return he promised to have her voted whatever titles she wished as soon as their position seemed secure. As proof of his good faith, he put her own name alongside his own in all letters of state. As a proof of hers, she gave him the key of the common cipher, though not that of the cipher extraordinary, the secret of which she pretended had died with Augustus. It was in the cipher extraordinary that the dossiers were written.
Now, about Germanicus. When at Lyons he heard of Augustus's death, and of the terms of his will, and of Tiberius's succession, he felt it his duty to stand loyally by the new regime. He was Tiberius's nephew, an adopted son, and though there was no true affection between the two, they had been able to work together without friction, both at home and on campaign. He did not suspect Tiberius of complicity in the plot that had brought about Posthumus's banishment, and he knew nothing of the suppressed will, and further, he still believed Posthumus to be on Planasia, for Augustus had told nobody but Fabius either of the visit or of the substitution. He decided, however, to return to Rome as soon as he could and frankly discuss the case of Posthumus with Tiberius. He would explain that Augustus had told him privately that he intended to restore Posthumus to favor as soon as he had evidence of his innocence to offer the Senate, and that though death had prevented him from putting his intentions into execution, they should be respected. He would insist on Posthumus's immediate recall, the restoration of his confiscated estates, and his elevation to honorable office, and lastly, on Livia's compulsory retirement from state affairs as having unjustly engineered his banishment. But before he could do anything in the matter, news came from Mainz of an army mutiny on the Rhine, and then, as he was hurrying to put it down, news of Posthumus's death. Posthumus, it was reported, had been killed by the captain of the guard, who was under orders from Augustus not to let his grandson survive him. Germanicus was shocked and grieved that Posthumus had been executed, but had no leisure for the moment to think of anything but the mutiny. You may be sure, though, that it caused poor Claudius the greatest possible grief, for poor Claudius, at this time, never wanted for leisure. On the contrary, poor Claudius was hard put to it often to find occupation for his mind. Nobody can write history for more than five to six hours a day, especially when there is little hope of anyone ever reading it. So I gave myself up to my misery. How was I to know that it was Clement who had been killed, and that not only was the murder not ordered by Augustus, but that Livia and Tiberius were also innocent of it. For the man really responsible for Clement's murder was an old knight called Crispus, the owner of the gardens of Salist, and a close friend of Augustus. At whom, as soon as he heard of Augustus's death, he had not waited to consult Livia and Tiberius at Nola, but immediately dispatched the warrant for Posthumus's execution to the captain of the guard at Planasia, attaching Tiberius's seal to it. Tiberius had entrusted him with this duplicate seal for the signing of some business papers, which he had not been able to deal with before being sent to the Balkans. Crispus knew that Tiberius would be angry or pretend to be angry, but explained to Livia, whose protection he at once claimed, that he had put Posthumus's out of the way on learning of a plot among some of the guard's officers to send a ship to rescue Julia and Posthumus and carry them off to the regiments at Cologne. There Germanicus and Agrippina could hardly fail to welcome and shelter them, and the officers would then force Germanicus and Posthumus to march on Rome. Tiberius was furious. 
that his name had been used in this way. But Livia made the best of things and pretended that it really was Posthumus who had been killed. Crispus was not prosecuted, and the Senate was unofficially informed that Posthumus had died by the orders of his deified grandfather, who had wisely foreseen that the savage-tempered young man would attempt to usurp supreme power as soon as news came of his grandfather's death, as indeed he had done. Crispus's motive in having Posthumus murdered was not a wish to curry favor with Tiberius and Livia, or to prevent civil war. He was revenging an insult, for Crispus, who was as lazy as he was rich, had once boasted that he had never stood for office, content to be a simple Roman knight. Content to be a simple Roman knight, Posthumus had replied, A simple Roman knight, Crispus? Then you had better take a few simple Roman riding lessons. Tiberius had not yet heard of the mutiny. He wrote Germanicus a friendly letter, condoling with him on the loss of Augustus, and saying that Rome now looked to him and his adoptive brother, Castor, for the defense of the frontiers, himself being now too old for a foreign service and required by the Senate to manage affairs at Rome. Writing of Posthumus's death, he said that he deplored its violence, but could not question the wisdom of Augustus in the matter. He did not mention Crispus. Germanicus could only conclude that Augustus had once more changed his mind about Posthumus on the strength of some information of which he himself knew nothing, and was content for a while to let the matter rest there. Chapter 15 the Rhine mutiny had broken out in sympathy with a mutiny among the Balkan forces. The soldiers' disappointment with their bequest under Augustus's will, a mere four months' bounty of pay, three gold pieces a man, aggravated certain long-standing grievances, and they reckoned that the insecurity of Tiberius's position would force him to meet any reasonable demands they made in order to win their favor. These demands included a rise in pay, service limited to 16 years, and a relaxation of camp discipline. The pay was certainly insufficient. The soldiers had to arm and equip themselves out of it, and prices had risen. And certainly the exhaustion of military reserves had kept thousands of soldiers with the colors who should have been discharged years before and veterans had been recalled to the colors who were quite unfit for service and certainly too the detachments formed from recently liberated slaves were such poor fighting material that Tiberius had considered it necessary to tighten up discipline choosing martinets for his captains and giving them instructions to keep the men constantly employed on fatigue duty and to keep the vine branch saplings their badges of rank constantly employed on the men's backs when the news of augustus's death reached the balkan forces three regiments were together in a summer camp and the general gave them a few days holiday from parades and fatigues. This experience of ease and idleness unsettled them and they refused to obey their captains when called out on parade again. They formulated certain demands. The general told them 
that he had no authority to grant these demands, and warned them of the danger of a mutinous attitude. They offered him no violence, but refused to be awed into obedience, and finally obliged him to send his son to Rome to convey their demands to Tiberius. After the son had left the camp on this mission, the disorder increased. The less disciplined men began plundering the camp and the neighboring villages, and when the general arrested the ringleaders, the rest broke open the guard room and released them, finally murdering a captain who tried to oppose them. This captain was nicknamed Old Give Me Another, because after breaking one sapling over a man's back, he would call for a second and a third. When the general's son arrived at Rome, Tiberius sent Castor to the general's support at the head of two battalions of guards, a squadron of guards, cavalry, and most of the household battalion, who were Germans, a staff officer called Sejanus, the son of the commander of the guards and one of Tiberius's few intimates, went with Castor as his lieutenant. Of this, Sejanus, I shall later have more to write. Castor, on arrival, addressed the mob of soldiers in a dignified and fearless way, and read them a letter from his father, promising to take care of the invincible regiments with whom he had shared the hardships of so many wars, and to negotiate with the Senate about their demands as soon as he had recovered from his grief for Augustus's death. Meanwhile, he wrote his son, had come to them to make whatever immediate concessions might be practicable. The rest must be reserved for the Senate. The mutineers made one of their captains act as their spokesman and present their demands, for no soldier would risk a doing so for fear of being singled out later as a ringleader. Castor said that he was very sorry, but that sixteen-year limit of service, the discharge of veterans, and the increase of pay to a full silver piece of day were demands which he had no authority to grant. Only his father and the Senate could make such concessions. This put the men into an ugly temper. They asked why in hell's name had he come then if he had no power to do anything for them. His father, Tiberius, they said, used always to play the same trick on them when they presented their grievances. He used to shelter behind Augustus and the Senate. What was the Senate, anyhow? A pack of rich, good-for-nothing lazybones, and most of whom would die of fear if they ever caught sight of an enemy shield or saw a sword drawn in anger. They began throwing stones at Castor's staff, and the situation became dangerous. But it was saved that night by a, by a fortunate chance. The moon was eclipsed, which affected the army. All soldiers are superstitious, in a surprising way. They took the eclipse for a sign that heaven was angry with them and their murder of old give me another and for the defiance of authority. There were a number of secret loyalists among the mutineers, and one of these came to Castor suggesting that he should get hold of others like himself and send them around the tents in parties or of two or three to try to bring the disaffected men to their senses. This was done. By morning, there was a very different atmosphere in the camp, and Castor, though he consented to send the general's son again to Tiberius, with the same demands endorsed by himself, arrested the two men, who appeared 
to have started the mutiny and publicly executed them. The rest made no protest and even voluntarily handed over the five murderers of the captain as a proof of their own fidelity. But there was still a firm refusal to attend parades or do any but the most necessary fatigues until an answer came from Rome. The weather broke and incessant rain flooded the camp and made it impossible for the men to keep communication between tent and tent. This was taken as a fresh warning from heaven, and before the messenger had time to return the mutiny was at an end, the regiments marching obediently back to winter quarters under their officers. But the mutiny on the Rhine was a far more serious affair. Roman Germany was now bounded on the east by the Rhine and divided into two provinces, the upper and the lower. The capital of the upper province, which extended up into Switzerland, was Mainz, and that of the lower, which reached north of the Scheidt and Sambre, was Cologne. An army of four regiments manned each of the provinces, and Germanicus was commander-in-chief. Disorders broke out in a summer camp of the lower army. The grievances were the same here as in the Balkan army, but the conduct of the mutineers was more violent because of the greater proportion of newly recruited city freedmen in the ranks. These freedmen were still slaves by nature and accustomed to a far more idle and luxurious life than the freeborn citizens, mostly poor peasants, who formed the backbone of the army. They made thoroughly bad soldiers, and their badness went unchecked by any regimental esprit de corps. For these were not the regiments which had been under the command of Germanicus in the recent campaign. They were Tiberius's men. The general lost his head and was unable to check the insolence of the mutineers, who came crowding round him with complaints and threats. His nervousness encouraged them to fall on their most hated captains, about twenty of whom they beat to death with their own vine saplings, throwing their bodies into the Rhine. The remainder they jeered at and insulted and drove from the camp. Cassius Charia was the only senior officer who made any attempt to oppose this monstrous and unheard of behavior. He was set upon by a large party, but instead of running away or begging for mercy, rushed straight into the thick of them with his sword drawn, stabbing right and left, and broke through to the sacred tribunal platform where he knew that no soldier would dare to touch him. Germanicus had no battalions of guards to support him, but rode at once to the mutinous camp, with only a small staff behind him. He did not yet know of the massacre. The men surged about him in a mob, as they had done about their general, but Germanicus calmly refused to say anything to them until they had formed up decently in companies and battalions under their proper banners, so that he should know whom he was addressing. It seemed a small concession to authority, and they wanted to hear what he had to tell them. Once they were back in military formation, a certain sense of discipline returned, and though by the murder of their officers they had put themselves beyond hope of his trust or forgiveness, their hearts suddenly went out to him as a brave and humane and honorable man. One old veteran, there were many there who had been serving in Germany twenty-five and thirty years before this, called out, How like he is to his father! And another, 
He's got to be cursed good as be as cursed good as him. Germanicus began in a voice of ordinary conversational pitch to command more attention. He first spoke of the death of Augustus and the great grief it had inspired, but assured them that Augustus had left behind him an indestructible work and a successor capable of carrying on the government and commanding the armies in the way that he himself would have wished. Of my father's glorious victories in Germany, you are not unaware. Many of you have shared in them. Never was there a better general or a better man, shouted a veteran. Hurrah for Germanicus, father and son. It is a comment on my brother's extreme simplicity that he did not realize the effect his words were having. By his father, he meant Tiberius, who also was often styled Germanicus, but the veterans thought he meant his real father, and by Augustus's successor, he meant Tiberius again, but the veterans thought that he meant himself. Unaware of these cross purposes, he went on to speak of the harmony that prevailed in Italy and of the fidelity of the French, from whose territory he had just come, and said that he could not understand the sudden feeling of pessimism that had overcome them. What ailed them? What had they done with their captains and their colonels and their generals? Why weren't these officers on parade? Had they really been expelled from the camp, as he had heard? A few of us are still alive and about, Caesar, someone said, and Cassius came limping through the ranks and saluted Germanicus. Not many. They pulled me off the tribunal and have kept me tied up in the guardroom without food for the last four days. An old soldier has just been good enough to release me. You, Cassius! They did that to you. The man who brought back the eighty from the Teutoburger forest. The man who saved the Rhine bridge. Well, at least they spared my life, said Cassius. Germanicus asked with horror in his voice. Men, is this true? They brought it on themselves, someone shouted. And then a fearful hubbub arose. Men stripped themselves to the skin to show the clean silver scars of honorable wounds on their breasts and the ragged, discolored marks of flogging on their backs. One decrepit old man broke from the ranks and, running forward, pulled his mouth open with his fingers to show his bare gums. Then he shouted, I can't eat hardtack without teeth, General, and I can't march and fight on slops. I served under your father in his first campaign in the Alps, and I'd done six years service even then. I've two grandsons serving in the same company as myself. Give me my discharge, General. I dandled you on my knees when you were a baby. And look, General, I've got a rupture, and they expect me to march twenty miles with a hundred pounds weight on my back. Back to the ranks, Pomponius ordered Germanicus, who recognized the old man and was shocked to find him still under arms. You forget yourself. I'll look into your case later. For heaven's sake, show a good example to the young soldiers. Pomponius saluted and returned to the ranks. Germanicus held up his hand for silence. But the men went on shouting about their pay and the unnecessary fatigues put on them, so that they hardly had a moment to themselves from revile, toot lights out, and that the only discharge a man got from the army now was to drop dead from old age. Germanicus made no attempt to speak until he had complete quiet again. Then he said, In the name of my father Tiberius, I promise you justice. He has your welfare at heart. 
as deeply as I have. And whatever can be done for you, without danger to the Empire, he will do. I'll answer for that. Oh, to hell with Tiberius, someone shouted, and the cry was picked up on all sides with groans and catcalls. And then suddenly, they all began to shout, Up, Germanicus! You're the emperor for us! Chuck Tiberius into the Tiber! Up, Germanicus! Germanicus for emperor! To hell with Tiberius! To hell with that bitch Livia! Up, Germanicus! March on Rome! We're your men! Up, Germanicus! Son of Germanicus! Germanicus for emperor! Germanicus was thunderstruck. He shouted, You're madmen to talk that way. What do you think I am? A traitor? A veteran shouted, None of that, General. You said just now that you'd take on Augustus's job. Don't back out. Germanicus then realized his mistake, and when the cheers of Up Germanicus continued, he jumped off the tribunal and hurried to where his horse was standing tied to a post intending to mount and gallop wildly away from this accursed camp. But the men drew their swords and barred his way. Germanicus, beside himself, cried, Let me pass, or by God, I'll kill myself. You're the emperor for us, they shouted. Germanicus drew his sword, but someone caught at his arm. It was clear to any decent man that Germanicus was in earnest, but... A good many of the ex-slaves thought that he was making a hypocritical gesture of modesty and virtue. One of them laughed and called out, Here, take my sword, it's sharper. Old Pomponius, who was standing next to this fellow, flared up and struck him on the mouth. Germanicus was hurried away to his friends to the general's tent. The general was lying in bed half dead with dismay hiding his head under a coverlet. It was a long time before he could get up and pay his respects to Germanicus. His life and that of his staff had been saved by his bodyguard, mercenaries from the Swiss border. A herd council was held. Cassius told Germanicus that from a conversation which he had overheard why, lying in the guard room, the mutineers were about to send a deputation to the regiments in the upper province to secure their cooperation in a general military revolt. There was talk of leaving the Rhine unguarded and marching into France, sacking cities, carrying off the women, and setting up an independent military kingdom in the southwest protected in the rear by the Pyrenees. Rome would be paralyzed by the move, and they would remain undisturbed long enough to be able to make their kingdom impregnable. Germanicus decided to go at once to the upper province and make the regiments there swear allegiance to Tiberius. These were the troops who had recently served directly under his command, and he believed that they would remain loyal if he reached them before the deputation of mutineers. They had the same grievance about pay and service. He was aware, but their captains were a better set of men, chosen by himself for their patience and soldiery qualities, rather than for the, their reputation. But first, something had to be done to quiet the mutinous regiments here. There was only one course to take. He committed the first and only crime in his life. He forged a letter purporting to come from Tiberius, and had it delivered to him at the tent door the next morning. The courier had been secretly sent out at night with instructions to steal a horse from the horse lines, ride twenty miles southwest, and then gallop back at top speed by another route. The letter was 
to the effect that Tiberius had heard that the regiments in Germany had voiced certain legitimate grievances, and was anxious to remove them at once. He would see that Augustus's legacy was promptly paid to them, and, as a mark of his confidence in their loyalty, would double it from his own purse. He would negotiate with the Senate about the rise in pay. He would give an immediate and unqualified discharge to all men of twenty years' service, and a qualified discharge to all who had completed sixteen years. These would be called on for no military duty whatsoever except garrison duty. Germanicus was not as clever a liar as his uncle Tiberius, or his grandmother Livia, or his sister Lavilla. The courier's horse was recognized by its owner, and so was the courier, one of Germanicus's own grooms. Word went round that the letter was a forgery, but the veterans were in favor of treating it as authentic and asking for the promised discharge and the legacy at once. They did so, and Germanicus replied that the emperor was a man of his word and that the discharges could be granted that very day. But he asked them to have patience about the legacy, which could only be paid in full when they marched back to their winter quarters. There was not sufficient coin in the camp, he said, for every man to have his six gold pieces. But he would see that the general would hand over as much as there was. This quieted them, though opinion had somewhat turned against Germanicus as not being the man they had taken him to be. He was afraid of Tiberius, they said, and not above committing forgery. They sent parties out to look for their captains, and undertook to obey orders from their general again. Germanicus had told the general that he would have him impeached before the Senate for cowardice if he did not immediately take himself in hand. So, having seen that the discharges were made in due form and all the available money distributed, Germanicus rode off to the upper province. He found the regiments standing by waiting for news of what was happening in the lower province, but not yet in open mutiny, for Silius, their general, was a strong-minded man. Germanicus read them the same forged letter and made them swear allegiance to Tiberius, which they did at once. There was great emotion at Rome when news arrived of the Rhine mutiny. Tiberius, who had been strongly criticized for sending Castor out to the Balkan mutiny, which had not yet been put down, instead of going there himself, was now booed in the streets and asked why it was that the troops who mutinied were the ones whom he had personally commanded, while the others remained loyal. For the regiments that Germanicus had commanded in Dalmatia had not mutinied either. He was called on to go to Germany at once and do his own dirty work on the Rhine, instead of leaving it to Germanicus. He therefore told the Senate that he would go to Germany and began slowly to make preparations, choosing his staff and fitting out a small fleet. But by the time he was ready, the approach of winter made navigation dangerous, and the news from Germany was more hopeful. So he did not go. He had not intended to go. Meanwhile, I had had a hasty letter from Germanicus begging me to raise 200,000 gold pieces at once from his estate, but with the greatest secrecy. They were needed for the safety of Rome. He said no more, but sent me a signed warrant which enabled me to act for him. I went to his chief steward, who said that he could only raise half that amount without selling property. 
and that to sell property would make talk, which was what Germanicus evidently wanted to avoid. So I had to find the rest myself. 50,000 from my strong box, which left me with only 10,000 after I had paid my initiation fee to the new priesthood, and another 50,000 from the sale of some city property which had been left me by my father. Luckily, I had already had an offer for it, and such of my slaves as I could spare, but only men and women whom I considered not particularly devoted to my service. I sent the money out without two days, within two days of getting the letter asking for it. My mother was extremely angry when she heard that the property had been sold, but I was pledged not to tell her why the money was needed. So I said that I had been playing dice for two high stakes lately, and in trying to recoup my heavy losses, had lost twice as much again. She believed me, and Gambler was another stick to beat me with. But the thought that I had not failed Germanicus or Rome was ample compensation for her taunts. I was gambling a good deal at this time, I must say, but never either lost or gained much. I used to play as a relaxation from my work. After finishing my history of Augustus's religious reforms, I wrote a short, humorous book about dice, dedicated to the divinity of Augustus, which was to tease my mother. I quoted a letter that Augustus, who had been very fond of a dice, had once written to my father, in which he said how much he had enjoyed their game on the previous night, for my father was the best loser he had ever met. My father, he wrote, always made a great laughing outcry against fate whenever he threw the dog. But if a fellow gambler threw Venus, he seemed as pleased as if he had thrown her himself. It is indeed a pleasure to win from you, my dear fellow, and to say this is the highest praise I can bestow on a man, for usually I hate winning because of the insight it gives me into the hearts of my supposedly most devoted friends. All but the very best grudge losing to me because I am the emperor, and they think of infinite wealth, and obviously the gods should not give more to a man who already has too much. It is my policy, therefore, perhaps, you have noticed it, always to make a mistake in the reckoning after a round of throws. Either I claim less than I have won, as if by mistake, or I pay more than I owe, and hardly anyone but yourself, I find, is honest enough to put me right. I should have liked to quote a further passage in which there was a reference to Tiberius's bad sportsmanship, but of course I could not. In this book I began with a mock serious inquiry into the antiquity of dice, quoting a number of non-existent authors, and describing various fanciful ways of shaking the dice cup. But the main subject was naturally that of winning and losing, and of the title was How to Win at Dice. Augustus had written in another letter that the more he tried to lose, the more he seemed to win, and even by cheating himself in the reckoning, it was seldom that he rose from the table poorer than he sat down. I quoted an opposite statement attributed to Polio's, to my grandfather, Anthony, to the effect that the more he tried to win at dice play, and the more he seemed to lose. Putting these statements together, I deduced that the fundamental law of dice was that the gods, unless they had a grudge against him on another score, always let the man win who cared least about winning. The only way to win at dice, therefore, was to cultivate a genuine desire to lose. Written in a heavy style, parroting that of my 
Bugbear Cato. It was, I flatter myself, a very funny book, the argument being so perfectly paradoxical. I quoted the old proverb which promises a man one thousand gold pieces every time he meets a stranger riding on a piebald mule, but only on condition that he does not think of the mule's tail until he gets the money. I had hoped that this squib would please people who found my histories indigestible. It did not. It was not read as a humorous work at all. I should have realized that old-fashioned readers who had been brought up on the works of Cato were hardly the sort to enjoy a parody of their hero, and that the younger generation, who had not been brought up on Cato, would not recognize it as a parody. The book was therefore dismissed as a fantastically dull and stupid production written in painful seriousness and proving my rumored mental incapacity beyond further dispute. But this has been a very ill-judged discretion, leaving Germanicus, as it were, waiting anxiously for his money while I write a book about dice. Old Athenodorus would criticize me pretty severely, I think, if he were alive now.